first and foremost, William, what do you make of that grim discovery? Well, it's one of several very troubling examples of war crimes. We had quite a dossier already uh, involving uh, Haftar's forces from the east, uh, and two of his senior lieutenants are wanted by the United Nations. Uh, but now with the discovery of 106 bodies at Tarhuna Hospital, these mass graves that you mentioned, another 15 bodies a little closer to Tripoli today, booby-trapped uh, with, with uh, IEDs, um, all of these amount to war crimes, and it helps the UN build its case against the uh, uh, Eastern commander, uh, Haftar, and weakens its uh, case for international support. And William, the United Nations has come out and said that Libya's warring sides are actually fully engaged in military talks um, aimed at ending the fighting there. They actually called those talks productive. What do you think a political solution and transition looks like in that country? Well, the way we've been talking about it since the um, quasi-failure of the 2015 accord is that instead of having just a political track, we need a political track, a military track, and an economic track. Uh, and by separating those tracks and allowing the personnel from each side to deal with each other, uh, there's an idea uh, that somehow you can come, across, come, come out with a better deal. The problem is, is that a lot of the um, negotiations that are going on try to make things dependent on other things. So they try to say, well, politics can be forced if we do these economic things, or security can be forced if we do these political things, and the tracks don't necessarily track with each other. Ultimately, the deal is going to be a political deal. And the most important issue, as I've said probably 10 times on your air in the last three years, is the status and future of General Haftar himself. If he can be convinced to step down, you're probably 50% to a deal. Uh, if he isn't, and if he continues to be held up as the political leader as well as the military leader of the East, this is going to go on and on. And where do prospects stand right now for a ceasefire, given the fact that the U.S. President Donald Trump has joined calls for a ceasefire in Libya? And we've also seen support from the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Well, when the West was on the back heel, um, everyone was calling on the West to accept it, uh, um, a cease. Well, the, the, everyone was saying the East needed to have a ceasefire uh, in support of the West. And then now that the East is on the back heel, the East is agreeing to the ceasefire, and the West is trying to regain control of its territory. And I think what's missing in most of the analysis is that Western Libyans and a lot of Libyans around the country see what happened in 2011 as a revolution. And they see themselves as re-liberating areas. And to leave large swaths of the country under military control from the East, uh, and then get it going to the negotiation table, and then putting, you know, concretizing the status quo, uh, that basically says our revolution didn't mean anything. Um, so I don't think we'll have a ceasefire right away, despite enormous international pressure. However, I don't think the West can conquer the East. So there's going to be some consolidation and continuation of gains by the West until they reach the point where I think they feel they can't go any further. And that'll depend a lot on the international patrons and reducing the flows of arms and the uh, sending of mercenaries to either side in order to pressure them to get back to a negotiation table once things have settled down a bit more than they are now. William Lawrence, appreciate your analysis as always.